Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, today, in pursuance of my constitutional duty, I sent to the Congress a message on the State of the Union. And this evening, I am taking the opportunity to repeat to you some parts of that message. This war must be waged, it is being waged, with the greatest and most persistent intensity. Everything we are, everything we have is at stake. Everything we are and have will be given. We have no question of the ultimate victory. We have no question of the cost. Our losses will be heavy. But we and our allies will go on fighting together to ultimate total victory. We have seen a year marked on the whole by substantial progress toward victory, even though the year ended with a setback for our arms, when the Germans launched a ferocious counterattack into Luxembourg and Belgium with the obvious objectives of cutting our line in the center. Our men have fought with indescribable and unforgettable gallantry under most difficult conditions. The high tide of this German attack was reached two days after Christmas. Since then, we have reassumed the offensive. We have rescued the isolated garrison at Bastogne and forced the German withdrawal along most of the line of the salient. Oh, yes. For great days. Great I had day. intended to bring a, a little magical illusion with me, and I put it in the wrong jacket. No magic tonight? So, no magic tonight, and I also told myself that I would do what Mrs. Temple used to tell Shirley before every take, and I find I'm not doing it. Do you know what she used to say? No. This is really true. Just as they put that slate on, you know, take number four, whatever right. it is, littlest rubble. She'd say, sparkle, Shirley. Mm. Sparkle. sparkle, Shirley. Mm. So that's what I told myself behind the curtain. Sparkle, Orson. <laughs> Good evening. This is Orson Welles, inviting you to listen now to The Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad on Cresta Blanca's This Is My Best. <laughs> This is My Best, America's greatest stars in the world's best story. Presented each week by Shenley's Cresta Blanca Wine. Wine of friendly nature. Pride of the Vintner's Art. This is My Best debuted over CBS Airwaves on Tuesday, September 5th, 1944. Originally, it was a book of the month club. Producer Homer Thicket chose works from modern authors to be adapted for Hollywood radio stars. Six months later, Orson Welles abruptly took over. He initiated a shift to classics, debuting with Heart of Darkness on March 13, 1945. Orson Welles again. I can't tell you how truly pleased and proud I am to join the Cresta Blanca program. This is my best, and I'm glad to, to start off with an old favorite, a show the Mercury brought you first, a story we came to Hollywood to make a movie of. We never did. Maybe someday we will. But I think it's particularly well-suited to radio. Here it is. One of the best-regarded and most typical of the works of Joseph Conrad. The Heart of Darkness could be described as a deliberate masterpiece or a downright incantation. Almost we are persuaded that there is something after all, something essential, waiting for all of us in the dark areas of the world. Aboriginally loathsome, immeasurable, and certainly nameless. And this also has been one of the dark places of the earth. Eight bells. Guess I better call all hands. No hurry, mister. We can't put the ship anyway till the tide turns. Be nice to see New York again. What's that you say, Marlowe, about the dark places? Hmm? Oh, I was thinking of very old times. 
when our fathers first came here 400 years ago the other day. Imagine the feelings of a skipper of a fine frigate or a bark. A civilized man 400 years ago hove to off the battery here at the very end of the world. He'd land in a swamp, march through the woods, and in some inland post feel the savagery, the utter savagery that stirs in the forests, in the jungles, in the hearts of wild men. Has a fascination, too, that goes to work upon him. The abomination, you know. There's a man I knew once. I'd like to tell you about him. About the girl, too. Now you're getting somewhere. Uh, it's his story. Well, let's hear it, man. To understand everything, you ought to know how I got out there. How I went up that river into the dark country. Where I met him. It was before the war... I was just loafing around one of the big port towns looking for a ship when I saw that map in a shop window. I was standing there looking at it. I noticed a girl's face reflected in the glass. It's like a snake, isn't it? Oh, I beg your pardon? The river. Oh, it's the river. On the map? Yes. The way it coils inland there from the coast. Yeah, it does look like a snake, doesn't it? And that delta there at the mouth of the river, it's like a bird. As if the snake had hypnotized a silly little bird. Please, I hope you don't think I spoke to you because... Oh, no. Well, you see, I, I come here often to look... No, nah, don't start apologizing. That'll spoil everything. Well, the truth is that I have a personal interest in that country shown there on the map. I've never been there, nearly everywhere else, but... Feeling all right? It's just a little cold. It always is here in the early morning. Well, the sun's shining brightly at the end of the street. There. I know. I often sit there watching the ships in the harbor. Well, let's go watch them together, shall we? We walked in silence, this strange girl and I, until something, or the sight of the harbor, perhaps the sea reaches stretching out to the distant places of the earth, started her talking. It has been more than a year now since I've heard from him, but I know he's alive. The company was satisfied as long as he went on sending Ivory back to the coast. But now they say the Ivory has stopped coming. Oh, I should think they'd send an expedition to see what's happened to your friend. That's unexplored country. The company owns a good steamboat, I believe, but it needs an expert navigator. They have not found a man who was willing to try it. Well, I've never been a freshwater sailor, but I'm looking for a ship. Would you... Well... Go on to the company office. <laughs> Look here, what are you talking me into? Don't you see it's his work? His work that's so important. Well, I don't mean to be rude, but bamboozling a bunch of savages for a few elephant tusks, <laughs> that can't be so important. But Eric has a plan, you see. The dark country is the beginning only. His plan will change the world. You really believe that, don't you? What's the name of this remarkable fiancé of yours? Quartz. Eric. Could. But what was it, this plan of his? Well, I don't pretend to have understood it later on when I met him. Well, we'll come to that part of the story. We interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin from CBS World News. A press association has just announced that President Roosevelt is dead. The president died of a cerebral hemorrhage. All we know so far is that the president died at Warm Springs in Georgia. On April 12, 1945, at Warm Springs, Georgia, President Franklin D. Roosevelt was sitting for a watercolor commission. He suddenly complained of a terrible headache, then slumped forward into his chair unconscious. He was carried into his bedroom. The president's attending cardiologist rushed to the scene. His diagnosis was a massive cerebral hemorrhage. The president died at 3.55 p.m. He was 63. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Fulton Lewis, Jr., speaking from the Mutual Studios in New York City. This nation has suffered this day a staggering loss. At this moment, at Warm Springs, Georgia, President Franklin D. Roosevelt lies with the problems of the nation 
Finally lifted from his shoulders, stricken late this afternoon with cerebral hemorrhage. He passed away before his physicians could be of any assistance, if assistance in such a case is possible at all. Vice President Harry Truman, who from here on will be President Truman, went immediately to the White House. A special cabinet meeting was called, and we should know more about what is going to happen in Washington as the evening wears on. But Franklin D. Roosevelt, the first president to be elected for four terms in the White House, has passed away, and that is the overshadowing of all news events that have happened or can happen for quite a while. Fiorello LaGuardia, New York City's mayor, offered remarks on his WNYC radio program that evening. My fellow New Yorkers, the one dominant thought in our minds is that shared by 130 million Americans in our country and hundreds of millions of men and women throughout the world. The greatest casualty of the entire world now suffered by all the people of the world. The shock is so great that under ordinary conditions it would be exceedingly difficult to absorb. But we must carry on because of him whose death the entire world mourns. On the morning of April 13th, Roosevelt's body was placed in a flag-draped coffin and loaded onto the presidential train. Along the route to Washington, thousands flocked to the tracks to pay their respects. Here are the great, and here too are the many like you and I. He was the leader for us all. An official delegation headed by President Harry S. Truman is here. The train has just pulled in, and the special honorary guard the bearers representing two non-commissioned officers from each of the services, Army, Navy, Coast Guard, and Marine Corps, have lifted the late President Roosevelt from the train and onto a caisson, which is pulled by six white horses, and very shortly we expect that the caisson will start its solemn, sorrowful procession through Washington. The Army Air Forces Band is playing music. Perhaps you can hear it in the background. Here, as well as the official representation, which involves virtually every high official in the government and from the embassies, are the Roosevelts, the Bottingers, the Elliot Roosevelts, Mrs. John Roosevelt and Mrs. Franklin Roosevelt. John and Franklin, on duty for their country, were unable to be here. On the way up from Warm Springs in that long, slow trip, I'm told that a plane circled overhead virtually all the way. Here also, I can see every member of the cabinet, James Burns, the Supreme Court, Senators White and Allender, we're going to try to walk out nearer the nearer the caissons and therefore nearer the Army Air Forces band. Perhaps you can hear some of the music that they're playing. They're quite a ways in the distance. Crowds are lining Constitution Avenue from here at the trackside to the White House where this procession ends.
After a White House funeral on April 14th, the president went by train to his Springwood estate in Hyde Park, New York. He was buried the next day. That same day, April 15th, 1945, Edward R. Murrow delivered his report from Buchenwald that forever changed society. Permit me to tell you what you would have seen and heard had you been with me on Thursday. It will not be pleasant listening. If you're at lunch, or if you have no appetite to hear what Germans have done, now is a good time to switch off the radio. For I propose to tell you of Buchenwald. It is on a small hill about four miles outside Weimar, and it was one of the largest concentration camps in Germany, and it was built to last. As we approached it, we saw about a hundred men in civilian clothes with rifles advancing in open order across the field. There were a few shots. We stopped to inquire. We're told that some of the prisoners had a couple of SS men cornered in there. We drove on, reached the main gate. The prisoners crowded up behind the wire. We entered. And now let me tell this in the first person, for I was the least important person there, as you shall hear. There surged around me an evil smelling horde. Men and boys reached out to touch me. They were in rags, in the remnants of uniforms. Death had already marked many of them, but they were smiling with their eyes. Two days later, Orson Welles took to the air on This Is My Best with an episode entitled, I Will Not Go Back. Now listen to This Is My Best. Presented each week by Shenley's Cresta Blanca Wine. Wine of friendly nature, pride of the vintner's art, symbol of hospitality, compliment to honored guest, a wine to serve proudly, saying, this is my best. This is Cresta Blanca. C-R-E-S-T-A? B-L-A-N-C-A. Cresta Blanca. Cresta Blanca. Tonight, Cresta Blanca Wine, sponsor of This Is My Best, departs from its usual series of dramatic presentation of the world's great stories to bring you this special broadcast in keeping with the events of the times. Written by Milton Geiger and titled, I Will Not Go Back. And now, our producer. This is Orson Welles. Last week, an American president fell in the midst of battle. This radio program is dedicated to the American future he so greatly served and to the new president who has taken over that high service. Six weeks before he died, Mr. Roosevelt wrote me these words. April will be a critical month in the history of human freedom. It will see the meeting in San Francisco of a great conference of the United Nations the nations united in this war against tyranny and militarism. At that conference, the peoples of the world will decide through their representatives and in response to their will whether or not the best hope for peace the world has ever had will be realized. Discussions by the people of this country and by the peoples of the freedom-loving world of the proposals which will be considered at San Francisco are necessary, are indeed essential, as the purpose of the people to make peace and to keep peace is to be expressed in action. I've quoted in part from Mr. Roosevelt's last letter to me. Tonight's broadcast is one of those discussions he felt we ought to have. It's a broad and general discussion without technicalities or politics. It deals with somebody called man with his age-long preparation for April 25th, 1945, with his high task, which is the keeping of peace on earth, in justice and in decency, for all time. Over the 
concrete and the steel, astride the mills and factories, the temples and the farms, the thunderous commerce of the cities, the oceans and the rivers to the oceans, over the hills, the mountains and the valleys of earth, over the fervent hush of the hopeful peoples, watches a spirit I will not go back. Out of the mists of time, out of the ancient yesterday, the spirit came. Out of the mists of time, out of the ooze and slime, out of the dreadful dawning, out of the dim, wet morning of the earth, I came, and I will not go back. Now the earth was without form. Wells' tenure at the helm of This Is My Best was stormy and brief. He argued with the network and sponsors agency. They felt he hijacked the show and undermined the weekly budget. Untenanted. He was fired on April 24th, and there was the restless charged with compromising the show for his personal agenda. He had scheduled the play, Don't Catch Me, which he had been trying to develop into a film for he and Rita Hayworth. Time stood speechless among the blank and silent days. Wells' last appearance was in a play entitled, Anything Can Happen. There was eternity, and there was a plan, and reason. There was God. Victory in Europe was achieved on May 7th. 